I am very excited to welcome to the stage Erica, Dante, and Daniela to speak to us about Osiris Rex. If you don't know about Osiris Rex, you will soon be a huge fan as well. And so I will just turn it over to you all. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here with two other illustrious faculty members. Um, so my name is Erica Hamden. I'm uh, an associate professor at the U of A in astrophysics, and I'm the director of the Arizona Space Institute. Um, and despite what it says on the uh, slides, I do not work on OSIRIS-REx, although I'm a huge fan. Um, and here with me today are two other faculty members, uh, Dante Loretta and Danny Delagustina, who are both integral parts of the OSIRIS-REx team. Um, and Dante has also just started an astrobiology institute. So over the course of this panel, I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk both about OSIRIS-REx and the follow-on mission APEX, and then about um, astrobiology and um, how we're gonna discover so many cool things about uh, life in the universe. So do you guys wanna each just briefly introduce yourselves? Sure, I'll start. I'm Dante Loretta, Regents Professor of Planetary Science at the University of Arizona. I've been here about 22 years. I'm also a graduate from U of A uh, with a Bachelor of Arts in East Asian Studies and a Bachelor of Science in Math and Physics. And for the past 20 years, I've been dreaming about bringing asteroid samples back to the Earth. And on September 24, 2023, we did that. So we're into the next phase of the mission. Thank you. Uh, I'm Danny Della Justina. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Arizona, and I'm also, also Dante's second in command on OSIRIS Rex as the deputy principal investigator. Um, after we successfully brought these samples home in late September, our spacecraft uh, made a maneuver to avoid hitting the Earth and started a new journey to a new asteroid called Apophis, and I'll be leading that mission as OSIRIS Apex or Osiris, the Apophis Explorer. So um, I'm also a U of A alum. I got my bachelor's and my PhD, and um, I'm so happy to be uh, back at the university as, as an assistant professor, and um, really excited for what we're gonna be doing next on APEX, and also the work that's gonna be done through uh, the Astrobiology Center that Dante has recently started up. Okay, so my first question, Dante, you said that for 20 years you've wanted to bring back an asteroid sample. Why? Great question. So when you visit an asteroid, you're going back to the beginning of our solar system. These are the geologic remnants from the protoplanetary disk. When a star forms, it's through the collapse of a structure we call a giant molecular cloud. You might have seen the amazing recent James Webb Space Telescope images of star forming regions. And there's a physics property called angular momentum, and that has to be conserved, which is measurement of the rotation basically, and th that causes some of the material to spin out into a disk, and that's where all the planet building happens. And the asteroids escaped most of that history. They were there for the very beginnings of solid material formation, but they didn't get incorporated into the planets. And if we want to understand some key questions, like why is the Earth a habitable world? How did it get the liquid water that makes up the oceans and the hydrosphere, the air? that we breathe, and most importantly, the carbon that makes up the central uh, element of all life on Earth. We think these asteroids were where that material was delivered to our planet. So we're asking these deep questions, trying to understand the origin of life, and also understand if this might have happened elsewhere in our solar system, throughout the galaxy, and throughout the universe. So that's my interest, um, the origins guy. I think Danny might want to talk about planetary defense, which is another key aspect of the OSIRIS-REx and APEX missions. Yeah, thanks, Dante. So um, there are many asteroids in the inner solar systems whose path crosses the path of Earth uh, or Earth's orbit. And we understand the, these trajectories of asteroids going out about 100 years just based on the data we can gather from telescopes here on Earth. We know right now there is no known asteroid threat for the next 100 years, but after that, things get a little foggier. And so um, Bennu, the asteroid that was visited and sampled by the OSIRIS-REx mission, was, gave us this unprecedented opportunity to study other forces that act on these small asteroids in near-Earth space that can perturb their orbits in ways that we don't have a good handle on yet. This gave us um, a measurement being basically 
co-located flying in formation with Bennu for about two years, as well as a, a long history of, of observing it from the ground, gave us the opportunity to study one such effect called the Yarkovsky effect, which basically is, is um, a little thrust that gets applied to the asteroid by sunlight as it's moving around uh, the inner solar system. And so by taking this effect, can, can, including it in our estimates of Bennu's orbit going into the future, we now know that it is the most hazardous near-Earth asteroid. It has about a half a percent chance of impacting the Earth at some point within the next 300 years, and the most likely opportunity is in the year 2182. And so um, a big part of OSIRIS-REx is understanding our past, our origins, how did life form on our planet, how did asteroids maybe contribute to that, but also understanding our future and being able to secure our future by studying uh, one such near-Earth asteroid um, to gather this, this data. We'll be able to do the exact same thing for Osiris Apex, looking at another near-Earth asteroid called Apophis, which gets very close to the Earth in the year 2029, so close it'll be um, 10 times closer than the moon. So I'm curious, when Osiris Rex was at Bennu, and I'm sure that there were things that you discovered that you weren't expecting, and so I'm curious about some examples of that, and also if you have any ideas of like when you get to Apophis, is it, there gonna be a similar kind of discovery space? I'll take the Bennu question. Is, uh, I call Bennu the trickster asteroid because it definitely challenged us right from the very beginning. Um, when we arrived and those first resolved images came in, it did not look like we had anticipated based on our analysis of a very extensive telescopic data set. I had convinced myself and the team and NASA and the public and anybody who would listen that the surface was gonna be smooth, that the particles were pretty small. I use the term, the beach, Bennu Beach. Uh, and this was based on how it heats up and cools off, which is very quickly, very much like the beach sand does. And also the shape, which we had a good estimate of from uh, planetary radar data. And the way the radar beam interacted with the surface, all of that seemed consistent with relatively small grains of you know, an inch or less. And we got there, and the surface was not like that at all. It was very rough and rugged, covered in giant boulders, with no beach anywhere in sight. And uh, we didn't have the capability to get the spacecraft down to the surface safely under that set of conditions. So immediately we had to go back and start writing software uh, to update the guidance system to give us a much more pinpoint landing. We called it bullseye tag for the touch and go uh, strategy that we were using. So we kind of accepted that early on in the, in the mission and got the team working. And then we went into orbit on New Year's Eve in 2018 and the surface started exploding. And we saw fragments flying off. It looked crazy, like very dynamic, hazardous to the spacecraft. And so there was a series of freak out days where we're trying to understand what's happening. And then we, as we started to process the data, we quickly realized that you know, the gravity environment of Bennu is about the same acceleration astronauts on the International Space Station experience. Very low gravity. Everything moves in slow motion. So even though these particles were flying off the surface, going into orbit, there was no hazard because it would be a very gentle contact. It would just bounce off the spacecraft. So it transitioned from uh, a potentially very dangerous scenario to a super cool science experiment because there was hundreds of these particles flying around Bennu and we could watch them and track them and map the gravity field at incredibly high precision, way beyond what we had designed the, the mission to achieve. So we got a lot of great science out of it. And then I think finally, when we sent the spacecraft down to make contact with the surface and collect the sample, we were kind of expecting a hard surface, like landing on a planet. And instead, it was like hitting a pool of water. And the surface just flowed away, and we sank in deeper than my arm length and got a, some great sample as a result of that. And then when we fired the, the thrusters to back away, we blew a crater that was like 8 meters or 25 feet across about 100 times what we expected to do to perturb the surface. And I think that plays into a cool experiment Danny and her team have in store for the Apex mission. Yeah, thanks, Dante. So uh, a couple things that we know we don't know yet about asteroid Apophis, uh, which we'll be visiting with, with the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft in its new um, extended mission. First off, as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, Apophis, this, this small asteroid, it's about the size of Bennu, so about as long in its widest dimension as the Empire State Building is tall. Um, it will get very close to the Earth in the year 2029, as I mentioned, about 10 times closer than the moon. And this actually brings it closer than many geosynchronous satellites that are in orbit around the Earth. We don't have the best feel for how a small object is going to behave when it is so close to the Earth and really uh, experiencing a gravitational tug from uh, our, our much larger planet's um, uh, giant mass um, exerting this force across it. And so we have some ideas of, of how it might behave, but they vary a lot depending on our assumptions. Um, we think there might be landslides across the surface. We think particles might eject in a really similar way to how we observed on Bennu. And uh, one of the, the great things about OSIRIS-REx at Bennu is it gave us some clues about processes that can happen on these small bodies that we hadn't really, uh, we, we didn't have such rich data of before. So we can use that to inform some of our guesses, but we really don't know how Apophis is gonna behave when it's tidally tugged on by Earth. We also learned from Bennu that these small bodies, as, as Dante mentioned, they are super weak. So you can, you know, the, the surface is more like a giant pit of balls than a solid rock. Even though when you take a look at pictures of these, they look pretty rocky and, and um, like, they, like they'd have solid ground. So we, Bennu has a very different composition than Apophis. It's really rich in uh, clay, water-bearing minerals, and organic molecules, and that's exactly the reason why we visited it. Apophis, on the other hand, um, it's dominated by uh, more rocky minerals that are analogous to what we might see on Earth. So there's a little bit of a question mark. Can we expect an object like Apophis to behave like Bennu if we interact with its surface? We don't have a sampling mechanism on the OSIRIS Apex spacecraft. We use that to gather material from Bennu and bring it back to Earth. But one serendipitous uh, finding from OSIRIS-REx is when we got really close to the surface of asteroid Bennu in order to gather the sample, our spacecraft thrusters pushed a lot of material around. And so we're gonna do something similar at Apex. We're gonna get really close to the surface of asteroid Apophis and we're gonna fire up our thrusters and just see how much material can we displace. You know, our thrusters can exert known forces. Um, and using that information, seeing how much material we kick up, we're gonna be able to get better insights into whether or not the surface of Bennu is something we can expect on all these small asteroids, or is it something that's maybe unique to Bennu and its composition and, and the um, minerals that it, its rocks contain. This has some pretty cool implications for planetary defense because uh, the surface strength of these small bodies really will um, give us a lot of insights into how we might someday mitigate against an impact from one of them. And so if the surface is really weak, like in the case of Bennu, that would uh, give us a different set of parameters to design um, a, a mitigation mi mission versus Apophis, um, if, depending on what differences we find from this, uh, this surface interaction experiment. So I have a question related to that. So if you had two asteroids that are the same size, but one is like a loose collection of rubble and the other is a solid and they both enter the Earth's atmosphere, like I'm more worried about the solid one, but the loose collection of rubble, like what would that do? It's a good question. I would say we haven't taken all of the information we learned from Bennu and done those kinds of simulations. Uh, I have some, you know, I can speculate. Oh yeah, I speculate. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> it, it, since it's like a fluid, when I, when I try to think about what it might do when it hits the top of the atmosphere, I look at other objects that have flown through the atmosphere as fluids and I look at the tektites, which are these impact melts that get shot up into the atmosphere when an asteroid has hit the Earth in the past. Mm -hmm. And they make perfect like return capsule, aerodynamically designed uh, surfaces. So I think Bennu might deform as it enters the atmosphere into a, a perfect aerodynamic shape to make it all the way to the surface. Uh, there will be shock waves and fragmentation. We see that when asteroids enter the atmosphere already. And it, in the worst case, it will completely disaggregate and lots of little pieces will hit the Earth as opposed to a, a single coherent object 
And I always say, you know, would you rather get hit with a shotgun or a cannonball, right? It's, it's going to be somewhere in between those two. Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I'll just add, I mean, there's um, a lot of evidence of things called crater chains uh, on Earth and other objects around the solar system. And so um, these are basically craters that show up, as the name um, would imply, as little chains. And um, so it's possible if something like Bennu entered the atmosphere, you might have a couple different coherent pieces of material that do survive and would create a series of craters, um, at least based on what we see elsewhere in the solar system. Yeah, I think in either case, it would definitely ruin your day. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Luckily for all of us, we won't be around <laughs> when, when either of them are entering the atmosphere. Um, so I want to also talk about one of the other kind of um, objectives of the mission, which you picked Bennu because it was like clay-y and had some potential for like harboring precursors potentially for life. And so um, I wonder if you can share, like, do you feel like you picked a good asteroid in that sense once you actually got up close to it? And like, is there any, I know the sample return literally just happened, but are there any interesting tidbits you can share with us? I can say absolutely we picked the right asteroid. <laughs> it has been phenomenal, the science return from the spacecraft encounter, and we had like cameras that we built here at the University of Arizona, spectrometers from Arizona State University, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, laser altimeter provided by the Canadian Space Agency. And so we did a fantastic job surveying this object and it looked like the right target. We saw using the spectral instruments, clear signs of water, and that might surprise a lot of people. This is a small asteroid in the inner solar system. It's on an Earth-like orbit, very hot surface. I'm not talking about liquid water or ice like you would get on a comet. This is ancient water, kind of like a hydrothermal system. Think of uh, uh, Yosemite, or sorry, Yellowstone National Park, those very hot fluids interacting with stone, and they make clay minerals, and clays lock water up into their crystal structure, and it's stable to much higher temperatures than liquid water or ice would be. So that water was uh, captured in those minerals four and a half billion years ago, and has been floating around the solar system just waiting for us to come and find it to see if these kinds of minerals might have been the source of the water on Earth. We also saw abundant carbon all over the surface. We saw it in two different forms, one in organic molecules, like are present in biology or in oil deposits, and the other in a mineral phase uh, type called carbonates, which most people might be familiar with as kind of the white crusts that grow around your faucets here in Arizona because we have hard water with calcium and so carbonate. So Bennu has fluid. hard water. That's right. <laughs> And so uh, we see both of those, carbonate minerals and organic molecules. And so right away, I knew we had a good asteroid. The question was, could we get the right sample back? Um, very excited to say we got the sample to NASA's Johnson Space Center in late September. We have gotten into the sample collector, despite what you're reading in the media. We have extracted a lot of material, uh, enough to do all of our science. And we are seeing abundant water, about 9% by weight of the material that we've analyzed so far is water, about 5% by weight is carbon. Uh, we're seeing organic molecules and carbonate minerals and clay minerals, pretty much what we predicted from the spectral instruments, which is all really good news. We're just getting started, but the organic chemistry looks super exciting. I can't give a lot of details on that right now, but I can say it looks like an astrobiologist's dream come true. And for um, Apex, will you be able to do some of that same analysis even without the sample collection? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the target of Apex, asteroid Apophis, is it, it looks really different in composition from, um, from Bennu. So it's the type of uh, asteroid that maybe has a composition more similar to the moon in, in some senses than, um, than Bennu in that it's, it's full of uh, rock-bearing minerals, so um, things like olivine and pyroxene. Um, the types of things that, that we find pretty commonly um, on Earth where there's really high temperature forming um, processes that, that produce these rocks. So we'll be able to do a lot of the same analysis in terms of uh, looking at its composition. And one unique thing we can do, because we built this OSIRIS-REx spacecraft with spectral instruments that were designed to look for things like water and carbon, is we can take a look at a solar system object where maybe we didn't expect those types of, um, of precursors to, uh, to life um, and see if they actually are present. 
There is some ideas that maybe the solar wind, which is dominated by helium and hydrogen, as it's just pelting the surface of these small asteroids, and we have actually seen this on the moon, it implants a little bit of hydrogen. So if you can imagine a lot of these rock-bearing minimal minerals, they have oxygen in them, you're pelting them with hydrogen atoms, you'll form a small amount of water. And we have the opportunity with APEX, because we have instruments designed to look for water, to see if this hydrogen implantation is taking place. Small amounts of water are being created on the surface of Apophis by looking at it across different seasons. And if we do discover that, it means that virtually all small objects, uh, all these small asteroids, kind of regardless of their composition, del delivered at least some water to the early Earth. Um, and that's pretty exciting because asteroids like Bennu, we see a lot of the same s chemical signatures in uh, analog meteorites to Bennu as we see in Earth's water, but it's not a perfect fit. And um, this might help us resolve that, that small discrepancy. So Dante, you had mentioned organic molecules. And if, you, if people in the audience aren't chemists, they might be like, oh, organic, that means life. But is that actually what the organic molecules are a signature of? Yeah, in chemistry, when we talk about organic molecules, we're talking about carbon-based molecules that are not in these minerals, like carbonates, typically bonded with hydrogen. And that's why I said think of oil or tar or something like that. It's not alive, at least not anymore. Uh, and we think these materials were never alive, uh, but they look like the building blocks of life. And so we're looking for very key compounds um, like amino acids. Uh, if you take a protein supplement, you can look at the ingredient list and you'll see uh, how much of each of the 20 main amino acids that make up our proteins are in there. I'm gonna build that ingredient list for Bennu and tell you if you took Bennu as a protein supplement, what would your <laughs> amino acid uh, intake be? And we're, we, we suspect that there's gonna be a lot of the amino acids that are used biologically in these materials and that kind of gets you thinking, okay, these might have come from outer space, how do they get into a chain, which is what a protein is, uh, that can start biological processes? We're also looking for the nucleobases, which are the letters of our genetic code. They make up our DNA and our RNA. They determine how you're going to look, what your, you know, your eye color is going to be, what your hair color is going to be, all that kind of stuff. Those letters of the genetic code might have come from these asteroids as well. So we're looking at the building blocks, the things that were forming on these ancient asteroids that were delivered to the Earth, they were available for the origin of life. And that really starts to get us to think about how do you make that transition from rocky material with these trace organic molecules into a living thing? That's a really hard problem, and that's kind of at the center of astrobiology, is trying to figure out what happens when something becomes alive for the very first time. So you've just launched the Astrobiology Center at the U of A, and so it seems like you're moving from looking at a specific asteroid and these specific instances to a more general kind of view. So are there other things that you want to look at, other concepts that you want to explore as part of the center? Yeah, astrobiology is an all-encompassing discipline, and it's a really relatively young science, which makes it really fun. First of all, it's accessible to a lot of young people. Uh, because it's such a new discipline, new ideas, very interdisciplinary. We're talking to the biologists, we're talking to the astronomers, we're talking to the College of Humanities, College of Education, Center for Consciousness Studies to see if there's some link between life and consciousness. And so we really want to use the OSIRIS-REx sample return and the, the catalyst to understand the origin of life to go for this much bigger endeavor bringing together diverse experts from across the University of Arizona campus and really from around the world to take a holistic look, to inspire our students, to think about these big questions, to really get at the fundamental nature of what, what does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be conscious in this universe? Hopefully to give people an appreciation for these wonderful gifts that we have uh, and to try to understand how likely is this to have occurred elsewhere in our solar system we're looking on Mars, even on Venus, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, elsewhere in the solar system, and then exoplanets, right? The University of Arizona is a world leader in discovering and characterizing planets around other stars near us in the Milky Way galaxy. And we really want to know, are there other 
others out there, or are we alone in the universe? And so you really get into these profound questions, and the students love it, uh, and so we're really looking forward to being a major center for education, research, and outreach. So when you're talking about astrobiology and some of the work of the center, it sounds like there's, um, I mean, a lot of topics that are covered, but a lot of people, when they think about life in the universe, they're thinking about intelligent life that's like us, also looking out and being like, are we alone? But a lot of the astrobiology is actually much smaller scale. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I teach astrobiology at, at the U of A, and, and one of the things we spend a lot of time on is looking at the history of life on Earth. And you know, if you were thinking about alien astronomers surveying our solar system and looking at the Earth, for most of it, there was no civilization with technology. I mean, it's very, very recent occurrence, past couple hundred years, and really in terms of the digital res revolution, just a few decades where we have the kinds of technology that we associate with humanity and, and extraterrestrials. Most of the history of the Earth was dominated by single-celled organisms like bacteria and, and a similar group we call the archaea. That's most likely what we would expect to find just based on the history of our planet, right? Animals, plants, the fungi, they didn't show up until 540 to 700 million years ago. The Earth is four and a half billion years old. So I think we're going to find Earth at something like the Earth at, well in the geologic past, dominated by these single-celled organisms, maybe with photosynthesis and producing oxygen or sulfur, the other molecules that are produced through those reactions. But finding, we need to understand how does life progress to the point of an intelligent, technologically capable civilization. That would be the dream to find them, but I think more likely we're going to find the bugs. Bugs are still cool. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious if like people in the audience or people that are watching this later, if they're interested in getting involved or um, coming to the center for any type of programming, like what do you guys have available? So we're just, we're brand new. We're just getting started. We have a website, astrobiology.arizona.edu. So I would encourage you to, to visit that, interact with us. We are hearing from people all around the world that they're excited about what we're doing and looking for ways to engage. Uh, and we're still trying to define that, but people have offered to review proposals, work with students. So if you have expertise that you think would be relevant, we would love to get you on like an experts list or a, a backers list uh, to move forward. We are looking for sponsors. So if there's programs that you think that we would be applicable for, we'd love to hear from you about that as well. And really just to share in the awe and wonder of looking at the universe, understanding the enormity of it, and trying to appreciate how rare it is possibly that something like the Earth exists. And I think at the end of the day, I want people to take away, you know, it's such a precious and important planet. We should take good care of it. We should think about the future and what the people of the future are gonna need to, to thrive and sustain. And probably we should treat each other a little more nicely. I definitely agree with that message. <laughs> So in the last couple of minutes that we have, I want to hear from both of you about what you're most looking forward to um, in the next months and years for you know, your work. Yeah, so um, a, a couple of things in the near term. Uh, right now we are analyzing the OSIRIS-REx sample and it's just this explosion of information and knowledge. I worked really closely with the spacecraft data when the asteroid was in, in proximity to Bennu and developed a lot of hypotheses based on this data, which you know have big air bars on them because there's only so much you can learn about uh, an object it, when you're doing remote sensing, when you're studying it from uh, mostly distantly from a spacecraft. We have this really unique opportunity because we brought a piece of this asteroid home to study in our laboratories to validate a lot of those hypotheses. And so I want to see what I got right and what I got wrong. So far, I've got at least one thing right, which <laughs> is that the asteroid is pretty rich in magnetite, um, which is again a, a, a signature of some of this, um, the, the aqueous alteration or the interaction of rocky material with water. But I, I wanna see what else I got right and wrong. And then um, our spacecraft is now on its new journey to Apophis, and uh, one of the first things we do is we get really close to the sun. 
when we take uh, when when we do this uh, circuit through the inner solar system to eventually rendezvous with asteroid Apophis, and so making sure that our spacecraft is healthy and operating as we expect after these close passages to the sun, um, where things are going to get a little warm. So I think probably in the next couple months, those are the things I'm looking the most forward to. Yeah, I also call Osiris Rex the Daredevil spacecraft. Uh, Osiris Apex is about to perform its greatest stunt by getting very close to the sun and seeing if it can survive that passage. Uh, I think when I look, the thing I'm looking forward to the most is just the impact that the, the missions are going to have. Uh, Danny's a great example. I met her when she was 17 years old and she took my one credit seminar on asteroids at the University of Arizona. And, to, and the look at the, that she's leading this new team and this new mission into the future to uncover these amazing discoveries. There's a lot of Dannys out there, and the sample is very accessible. It's a great way to bring students in to the sciences. Uh, we have amazing laboratories at the University of Arizona. So I'm looking forward to being the professor and feeding it forward, inspiring the next generation, getting them excited about addressing these big questions, understanding our place in the universe, and just the legacy that it's going to leave behind for the University of Arizona is phenomenal. So the science is great, the engineering is great, but it's the inspiration uh, that I think brings the most value from these kinds of programs. And who knows, the students that are inspired by both of you and this work, who knows what amazing things they're going to discover in the future. So for me, that's one of the most exciting things about this, that like there'll be new people doing new things that we can't even imagine. So uh, thank you both for your time and for coming out here. And um, thank you to the audience for your um, attention. And um, do we, we don't have time. Yeah. We do. We can give you some time if you want. Oh, no, they don't have time. Great. Sorry. <laughs> They're extremely busy people, as you may imagine. <laughs> so thank you so much.